If you've never experienced the hell that is infertility, I guarantee you, you know somebody who has. And I can remember praying each night for a phone call. The pit in your stomach when the phone had rang and the absolute agony when we heard the treatments hadn't worked. It took Gwen and I years, but we had access to fertility treatments. And when our daughter was born, we named her Hope. You know, I hope he's not lying. I hope he's not lying. Yeah, he's lying. He's lying. All right, so last week, Tim Walls did a speech at the DNC and was talking about a very traumatic situation for many people in this country where he and his wife were trying to have a child. In fact, they named their beautiful daughter Hope because of the difficulties they went through. But what he's saying is not true. In fact, he never had IVF. Now, there lies controversy with pro-life members with IVF outside, but the type of IVF, in fact, it's not even called IVF, the active assistance he got was not controversial whatsoever. And so the perspective is he completely lied. He didn't tell like a half truth. He just flat out lied. For example, he never retired a command sergeant major in the National Guard. He actually retired a master sergeant. He also didn't serve in combat or carry a weapon of war into combat. And we can make sure that those weapons of war that I carried in war is the only place where those weapons were at. And that's important to highlight because two months prior to getting orders, which he definitely knew he was going to get orders to deploy to combat the following year, he retired. Well, people are like, he served 24 years honorably. Well, not really. I mean, yeah, if you think honorable on a discharge piece of paper is honorable service, sure. But first of all, 24 years in the National Guard is equivalent to about three and a half years of active service. Remember, it's one week in a month and two weeks of annual training a year. And apparently, after 24 years, he never served once in combat, despite being in a combat organization. Now, my perspective just like with this situation with the IVF, he's saying things that are going to be beneficial to him in the moment. People say things all the time that they don't mean, but he is the candidate for vice president of the United States of America. So yeah, excuse me, I'm holding him to a different standard than I do just Joe Schmo down the road. Okay, you see this thing going on with Harley Davidson recently. I have a pretty long history with Harley Davidson as my uncle who was in the Navy, my dad who was in the Army, used to ride Harleys and they used to show Harleys in Harley Davidson motorcycle shows during Daytona Beach Bike Week. And I grew up that way. One of my favorite pictures of my beautiful grandma Elizabeth is her sitting on my uncle's Harley Davidson motorcycle. I also remember very vividly my first motorcycle ride on a Harley Davidson at the age of five years old in Daytona Beach, Florida on my uncle who was at the time in the Navy on his Harley Davidson motorcycle. And I'll never forget it. It was nostalgic. I have a Harley Davidson show head in my basement in my house. And so the controversy stems from their CEO being a climate activist and communicating about his intent to basically integrate DEI and wokeism into Harley culture. And I heard from people who were at Sturgis. I was supposed to be at Sturgis. I got the invite at least. And they were at the Harley Davidson booth and said there was nobody there. It was crickets. Cycle drag showed you the Budweiser tent. And unfortunately, it looks like for, for the motor company this year, it may be affecting them. It looks like participation is way down under the Harley tent. At because there's a lot of people protesting Harley Davidson as a company as it sits today. Now, I looked into the details of the financials of Harley Davidson and this German CEO, who's supposedly a rock star in the financial world, is actually making them money. How do you become a company that is sold and bought constantly and always in debt, and then you're now more profitable, which provides all the benefit to the investors, and the public is mad at you? What you're going to see is situations like Bud Light, where they were the number one beer company in America, and now they're sitting at number three, something like 70 plus billion dollars of losses over time. And that's just what happens when you go woke, you go broke. And so my personal opinion is, I'm not selling my Harley. Harley has gone through periods of time 
uh, where they had great leadership and they had bad leadership. But tell me what you think in the comments down below. If you own a Harley, you're going to drag it into a field and hit it with a cannonball. What say you? So recently I did a video on carjacking for Phil Craft Survival's YouTube channel. I did three like preventative measures to prevent a carjacking. Now carjackings are up since 2019, 93%. So it was about six and a hundred thousand people would get carjacked per year, depending on the city, uh, increases obviously your probability of getting carjacked. But now that statistic is double. It's about 11.6, 93%. The demographic is about 20 to 34 years old. It's a very broad demographic. And it happens to happen in mostly inner city areas. Now, that's no surprise to me because violent crime across the board is up. Homicides are actually down. That's just some Darwinism on the side of that statistic. But when you look at the statistic of vehicles, for example, in Chicago last year, 1,307 vehicles were carjacked. Out of that 1,307, 79 arrests. Now, why would there be 79 arrests for 1,300 plus people being carjacked? Because it's considered a petty crime in most inner cities. It's like a crime that you don't care about. So you don't pay attention to it. Law enforcement officers don't actively go out. And if they've been defunded, like most of these inner city police departments, they don't even have the funds or the task force to go after these guys. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna figure out on your own a way to be best prepared. So I talked about three preventative measures. Situational awareness basically sums up all three. Let me just give you a little snippet of one of the things that I talk about. One of the things you could do is approach your vehicle from the front side instead of the back side. When you're parked inside of a parking lot, for example, Walmart, when you pull in, you're side by side other vehicles and when you walk down typically the road, which I don't know why we haven't figured out how to design parking lots. Like you're in the middle of the road where other cars are with your family avoiding getting ran over. So you're playing Frogger. And then you can't walk in front of the car because it's a very narrow bumper to bumper type deal because they're saving money on the parking lot and the setup. And then as you navigate to your vehicle, you come up from behind it, unlock the doors, and then you open the door. The problem is when you do that, you open the door and you set yourself into a position where you have nowhere to go. If you're gonna get carjacked, it's when you're getting in your vehicle or when you start your vehicle and you forgot to lock your door, which is another part of the pro tip. But when you do that, instead, do the opposite. Approach the vehicle from the front side. So while you're walking down that road, playing Frogger with vehicles, deviate your route, walk between the vehicles and hit it from the front. Walk down and then when you open the door, somebody's following you because they're trying to exploit you, you actually have an obstacle. Watch that video, I'll link it down below, the Phil Cross Survival Channel on YouTube. I'm getting back on the saddle and these type of things lending itself into preparedness. If you didn't know it, I know it, and many of my fellow veterans know this. The withdrawal in Afghanistan, the anniversary, is actually this week. It culminates on 30 August with the pullout of what I think is one of the biggest mistakes America has ever made in the history, at least in my lifetime. I mean, we've made a lot of mistakes. But this is a massive mistake where we pulled out. We had 13 service members that were tragically killed. And there was no consequence. Nobody lost their job. In fact, the guys on the ground who actually withdrew that were commanders and bosses, they got promoted. So if you F up, you move up. And that's very disappointing because with no accountability, with no consequence, we incentivize the future of our country with people just grossly making mistakes like the Secret Service not protecting a former president of the United States. I don't know. There's no consequence because you just retire. You just step down or step aside or you get promoted. That's how it works. Now, it's very tragic because a lot of the people that worked so hard with us and sacrificed it all to support us through a campaign in war when we shouldn't have been there in the first place and we abandoned them is so disheartening and disappointing. Why do I say that? Because you should never forget. Like how easily do we forget? Because we're on to the next agenda. I mean, the existing president of the United States who we haven't seen since he basically gave up, um, he was responsible as the commander in chief, yet there's no consequence. And you have to remember that when you vote. There's alarming statistics of hunters, gun owners, and veterans 
who are not registered to vote or who aren't voting, period. I talked about this with Joe Kent, who ran for Congress in Washington State, where the swing of him winning versus losing was only a few thousand, a very slim margin, yet we had tens of thousands of registered Republicans who didn't vote. And so what do we expect? And a lot of you guys think your vote doesn't matter, but why would you not vote? I'll talk about more of this in Patreon because there's certain things that I can't talk about. It's patreon.com forward slash Mike Glover. I'll link it down below in what we call the underground of my last week episode. So guys, I'd like to end this segment with the good news. And what's interesting, I looked on the news, all the news channels from AP to ABC, to NBC, CNN, Fox, all of them. And there's like no good news because that's the way the corporate media wants to position you. They want to position you against each other. So we're, what's the good news? Well, the good news is I went camping with my family this weekend and it was awesome. Like getting outdoors off my cell phone, away from social media, away from corporate media propaganda, I was so interested in getting outside with my family and I think we benefit from that. It's like a great reset. It's like blowing the dust out of the Nintendo cartridge. This weekend, I have my last rewilding course of the year. Super stoked about that. And also I'll be in San Bernardino at the end of September teaching both pistol and carbine on the 28th and 29th. I appreciate all the support that you guys have given me over the years, and it just feels good to be back. So thank you guys. I'm off to the underground. Later.